Perfect. All right, everybody, what is going on? And welcome to another edition of Swag Talk. Of course, this is the show. We cover the swag inside and out. And I am your tour guide around the swag, C. Wells. And I said um, I was going to do a football video uh, today, uh, but I want to continue on this basketball thing for just a just a hot little second. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about, you know, swag scheduling, swag seating, you know, swag being able to – you know, pick up a dub like uh, like Fairleigh Dickinson or Princeton or whoever um, in the tournament. And I just want to spend some time and talk about that. And then, you know, we're going to be, we're going to hit y'all with some football uh, later on in the week or uh, uh, Sunday or whatever. But I just wanted to go ahead and, and touch on this because like, you all know me, I know basketball is, is my thing. And I, I just felt like there was something to be looked into. So we're going to, we're going to chop it up about it. Um, but before we do any of that, man, y'all can check out the socials, uh, Facebook is Swag Talk, Instagram, Swag Talk, Twitter, Swag Talk 76. If you haven't done so already, man, won't you please go ahead and subscribe to the channel? Uh, it'd be much appreciated, man. We're trying to make our way up to 900. So, you know, if you can help us out with that, that'll be greatly appreciated. And hit that like button, man. Please, please hit that like button. Um, it, it definitely goes a long way in helping us continue to grow. Hit that like button, hit that notification bell. And feel free to come and your thoughts on this topic. So um, before we get into that, um, I did want to um, give out some condolences and uh, uh, rest in peace to the great Willis Reed. Um, he passed away um, all today. So um, just wanted to go ahead and, and, and show some appreciation. Like I always say, you know, we need to start showing people giving people their flowers before they go um and you know i'm always guilty of, of not doing that when i need to and you know i growing up i did not even know willis reed went went to ground i did not even know he was a swag guy all i knew from willis reed growing up was that uh that game in the in the finals uh where he came out uh hurt and and uh and, and helped the knicks to a championship that's that's really all i all i know uh all i knew growing up so um, first and foremost, obviously Willis Reed is a sweat guy. He's a Louisiana guy. Um, he went to Gremlin. Um He was a star at Gremlin. I, you know, he played at Gremlin from 1960 to 1964. Um, his he amassed over 2,200 points, 2,280 to be exact. Uh, he averaged 26 point 26 point six points and 21 point three rebounds in his senior year at Gremlin. That's a hell of a double double. Um, tremendous numbers right there. He led Gremlin to an NAIA title and three Southwest Conference championships. He was picked by the Knicks as the first pick in the second round in 1964. Uh, he made his name quickly as a dominating and physical force on both ends of the floor. Uh, in March of 1965, uh, he scored 46 points against the Lakers. That was the second highest single game total ever by a Knicks rookie. For the 64-65 season, he ranked seventh in scoring at 19 and a half points per game, fifth in rebounding, 14.7. He was uh, he made the All Star game, and he was the NBA Rookie of the Year while being named to the NBA All NBA All Rookie First Team. Uh, he continued to be a clutch player throughout his time with the Knicks. Um, in 1966-67, he averaged 20.9 points per game, and um, he scored 27 and a half points in the playoffs. He was a center um, at 6'9", and, you know, back in them days, you know, that that was really, you know, you, you had to be uh, a 6'10", 6'11", 7-footer to be a center back in them day, days. But he uh, he was a very physical player, often uh, having a good average in blocks and rebounding. Um, he, you know, he was listed at 6'10", with shoes on, but, you know, playing against guys like Wilt and Kareem, 
uh, he still ha- ha- managed to handle his business. Um, he, in 1969, 70, uh, he, he, the Knicks won 60 games, uh, setting a then NBA single game record with an 18-game winning streak. Uh, he became the first player in NBA history to be named All-Star Game MVP, regular season MVP, and finals MVP in the same season. That year, he was named All-NBA First Team and All-NBA First Team Defense while being named ABC's World Wide World of Sports Athlete of the Year in Sporting News NBA MVP. Um, his most famous performance, which is what I was speaking of, took place on May 8th, 1970, during Game 7 of the 1970 NBA Finals against the Lakers. Uh, he had a severe thigh injury, a torn muscle uh, that had previously kept him out of Game 6. He was considered unlikely to play in Game 7. However, he surprised the fans by walking onto the court during warm-ups, prompting widespread applause. Uh, starting the game, he scored the Knicks' first two field goals on his first two shots, which were his only shots of the game. Following the game in the locker room, uh, moved Howard Cosell told Reed on national television, you exemplify the very best that the human spirit can offer. Um, and then he would ultimately go on to help the Knicks uh, win another championship um, before um, knee injuries really started to uh, limit his mobility. Uh, his career was cut short by injuries, and he retired after the 1973-74 season. For his career, he averaged 18.7 points per game and 12.9 rebounds per game. Uh, he played in 650 games and seven All-Star games. Uh, following um, following his playing career, he spent several years coaching before moving into general management. He coached the Knicks from 77 to 78. He coached the Knicks in 77, 78, and left the team 14 games into the following season with a 49 and 47 record. He was head coach at Creighton from 81 to 85 and a volunteer assistant at St. John's. He also served as assistant coach for the Atlanta Hawks and Sacramento Kings. Uh, he debuted as the head coach of the Nets on March 1st, 1988. Um, he compiled a 33-77 record during his time with the Knicks, with the Nets, excuse me. Uh, in 89, he was hired as Nets general manager and vice president of basketball operations. Uh, he moved into uh, the position of senior vice president of basketball operations in 1996. And uh he helped the Knicks. He, I keep saying Knicks. He helped the Nets get to the NBA Finals in 2002 and 2003. Uh, he took a president, a position of vice president of basketball operations with the Hornets in 2004, and then he re- re- retired from that position in 2007. Uh, in 1970, Reed was inducted into the NAIA Basketball Hall of Fame. In 1982, he was enshrined in the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. In 97, he was elected to the NBA 50th anniversary team. Uh, in 2021, he was elected to the 75th anniversary team for the NBA. And uh, in, 19, in March 16, 2022, a game between Kent State and Southern Utah at the Basketball Classic was designated the Willis Reed game. Starting with the 2021-22 NBA season, the NBA Southwest Division Championship Trophy uh, is called the Willis Reed Trophy. So really, really good honors for him. Um, just like I say, real quick, NBA, NBA numbers, uh, 12,183 points total, eight, 18.7 point per game average, 8,414 rebounds, average of 12.9 rebounds per game, uh, 1,186 steals. I mean, assisting his career, uh, 1.8 assists per game. Like I said, two-time NBA champ, two-time NBA final MVP, in, uh, most valuable player, one time, seven time NBA All Star, NBA All Star Game MVP, All NBA First Team, four time All NBA Second Team, uh, NBA All Defensive Team, uh, All Defensive First Team, NBA Rookie of the Year, NBA All Rookie Team, and twice on the NBA uh, Anniversary Team, and his number number nineteen is retired uh, by the New York Knicks. So just wanted to uh, give Willis Reed a, a, a shout out, and you know. Rest in peace. Um, uh, prayers and condolences out to his family. Um, just, you know, we, lo- we lost another swag legend. So, you know, really, like I said, me and we all just need to get better on giving everybody their flowers while they're here. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't do it enough. And, you know, I had to sit here and do this now, you know, and I, you know, I don't really like that. So um, just want to give him his flowers and prayers to his family and the Gramlin State family. 
um, in the Grambling basketball program, everybody associated with Willis Reed and Grambling, man, my prayers and condolences go out to y'all. And um, which he's going to be missed. Um, so moving on from that somber note, man, we're going to talk a little bit of swag basketball. Um, that was an interview um, with um, Charles Edmond, um, by with C Charles Edmond and Commissioner McClellan. Um, I'm going to link that uh, that that audio. I'm going to link it in the description. Uh, but I got this information from HBCUsports.com. I'm going to link that article in my description as well. Just want to get a proper credit. And it basically just talks about um, the SWAC being a one bid league in the tournament. You know, it does does uh, Commissioner McClellan. Uh, foresee that changing. Um, he said that, basically paraphrasing that, you know, there's a long way for this, for the league to go before they, you know, they cross that threshold. And a lot of it stems from the non-conference scheduling, playing a lot of road games, playing power five games, you know, not winning non-conference games, you know, and it, it is, you know, it's one of those things that is going to have to be overcome some kind of way, somehow. Um, just looking at the conference this season, uh, the league was ranked 31st in, in the net, in the conference net rankings. Uh, we had a record of 20 and one 20 and one which is um, the worst non-conference record of any actual conference. Um, the only team, the only conference, well, it's not even a conference, but the independents had less wins than we did. Um, the SWAC had the lowest amount of wins and the lowest win percentage. Uh, the Northeast Conference, ironically, which is the conference that uh, Fairleigh Dickinson plays in, they were actually 32nd in net rating. And Fairleigh Dickinson had a net rating of 301, which Gremlin had a net rating of 180. So, you know, I think a lot of times we need to be careful when we look at how do you, when these teams win these games um, and realize that winning games in a tournament, no matter whether you are 16 seed, a 15, a 12, a 10, a 7, a 5, whatever. It's all about style of play and matchups um, and coaching, obviously. But um, because, you know, you can say, you know, you need X amount of four star guys, you need three star guys. Well, three of Fairleigh Dickinson's starting five were from D2. They had camaraderie from playing, playing with each other and playing with their coach that they were able to know where, you know, know how the system works inside and out. And those guys have been around a while. So, you know, a lot of times when you get a team that plays a, a system that doesn't match up with other teams in the tournament, especially on a quick turnaround, you can pick up those victories like that. So that's not to take anything away from what they did. You know, I, I, I watched all three of their games in the tournament and I love the way they play ball. Unfortunately, they got they got caught up in the in the small team trap. Their coach is gone uh, after one year. He's going to Iona, of all places. So, um, you know that's that's another reason why you know it's tough to see these teams grow. But what I wanted to do um, was look a little bit deeper into the scheduling part of this. Um, you know, like I said, it, it's you know it's a lot of it's a lot of things to be to be. Um, to be said, I mean, just looking, I, I was just randomly looking at the 1990, 1990 NCAA tournament bracket and Texas Southern was a 14 seed that year. So, you know, yes, there's more teams now, but there is, it is possible to get a higher seed, but it, it, it's, it, it takes a lot of different factors. And, and honestly, the, the committee, their, uh, their process of seeding teams is so hodgepodge. Um, you can't really say, that if you do this, you're going to get this seed. Because sometimes, you know, you might get a lower seed. Um, if there are some teams come in the tournament, you know, with worse records, you might bump up a line. You, or you may stay, you know, you may stay where you're at and they might just, you know, bump another mid-major up above you. Um, but some leagues are destined to finish, thir finish on that 13 and 14 line. Some are destined to finish 14, 15. Some 15 and then some just going to be 16s no matter what. So, um, I just wanted to look at some of the, you know, I, what I did was I went through, uh, I went back to 2017 and I looked at the 16 seed, the 15 and the 14 seed to see what their scheduling looked like. Um, just to see how different our scheduling was compared to theirs. And honestly, I didn't see a huge, huge difference. Um, 
and what I did was let's just start with let's just start with uh let's just start with 2017. Uh the the there were six six there were uh there were um six sixteen seeds that year, the four in the first four and then the two actual sixteen seeds. Uh Mount St. Mary's, they were um uh, they were in the first four. Uh they were first in their conference, but they went two and eleven in non conference play. Uh they didn't get any power six wins. Uh, they won two games against mid majors, and for the sake of my experiment, I consider everybody in this. I considered everybody who wasn't in a Power Six conference. That's the ACC, SEC, Big Ten, Big Twelve, Big East, and Pac twelve. Um, any any conference that's not in those in in that six, I considered them to be a mid major because I didn't want to get into low major, mid major, whatever. So um, they actually won two games against mid major teams. And they did not beat a power of 16. Uh, New Orleans, they were first in their conference. They went five and six in the non in the non conference. They won one power five game and one mid major game. Uh, North Carolina Central also finished first. They were seven and five. Uh, they won one power six game and five mid major games. And the last first four participant was UC Davis. They finished second in their conference. And they were uh, eight and seven in the non-conference with no mid, no power six wins, six mid-major wins. Uh, South Dakota State finished sixth in the conference, and they got the 16 seed. So I believe they were the actual worst 16 seed. Uh, they were seven and eight over in non-conference play, and they did not win a power six game. And they had five mid-major wins. Texas Southern was a SWAC rep- representative that year. They were four and nine in conf- in non-conference play. Uh, no power six wins and four mid major wins. So if you look at just that, just by looking at it that way, um, the, the swag is just even that even um, with everybody else on their seed line, um, just by the numbers. Now, obviously, um, it depends. You know, a lot goes into who you beat and you know how bad you lose. Um, but looking at it that way, um, it wasn't that that season. We weren't that far off. Um, just for reference, the 15 seeds that year were Troy. Uh, they were uh, tied for sixth place in their league, and they were eight and six in the non-conference. No, no, no power six wins, six mid-major wins. North Dakota won their league. They were five and five. They didn't win a, 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 a power power six game. And their non-conference schedule that year was horrible, like mad D twos and NAIs. Um, and they they are they they won two mid major games, so you know it's possible to get that 15 spot if you if you if if you build up a a, a, a resume that the committee will look at and like uh, Jacksonville State also was a 15 seed. They were third in their league, uh, nine and seven, uh, no power six wins, eight mid major wins. Northern Kentucky was the um, they were tied for second in that conference. They were nine and four. Uh, no power six wins and seven mid major wins. So that season in 2017, there were three power six wins. They all came from 14 seeds. So um, a lot of the teams that are that were in four, that were 14 seeds were kind of always going to be there. Uh, Florida Gulf Coast was a team who you know they went on a run a, a year or so before that. So they kind of got a 14 seed. Um, they started to get their respect and get that 14 seed. Um, looking at 2018. Uh, Long Island, um, they were uh, fourth in their conference. Uh, they made the first four. They uh, were five and eight overall. They did not win a power six game, and they won four mid-major games. I went back and counted this season just to see. Uh, they actually played um, – they actually played um, – they didn't play any power five teams that season. Uh, Radford was second in the, in their league. They were seven and six over in non conference. They didn't win a power six game and won six mid, mid six mid major games. They played three power six teams. Texas Southern. This was one. This 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 Texas Southern season here is one of the seasons that people use for their example when they want to say uh, the SWAC has bad schedules and it's not always like this. Uh, Texas Southern went zero and thirteen that year uh, in non conference play. Uh, they 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 had seven power five seven power six games on their schedule that year. So more than half of their schedule that year was uh, power six opponents. Um, so that's that's one of the that's one of the years that people love to use to point at 
um, as an example, and, and, and they say it like everybody does it. Uh, North Carolina Central, they finished sixth in the MEAC that year and made the first four. Uh, they had one Power Five opponent, and they were six and eight in non-conference play. Um, UMBC, who defeated Virginia as the first 16 seed over one seed in 2018, they actually finished second place in their league by a couple games. They, they, you know, they didn't even, you know, it wasn't like a tie or nothing like that. Uh, they finished second place in their league. They were nine and six in non-conference. They played one. Uh, they didn't. Uh, I don't believe they played any Power Five teams that year, and they did not beat a Power Five team. And they lost. They won six mid-major games. So, you know, looking at your schedule does not necessarily dictate how you're going to perform in the in the tournament. Um, like I said, this team lost games in their conference. They just, they won their conference tournament. They got a good matchup against a Virginia team who is was a very defensive team, uh, tended to struggle offensively, um, and they just had you know they just had the game of their lives and they beat Virginia and advanced. Um, the 15 seeds that year, uh, Bucknell. Let me excuse me. Uh, Iona was fourth in their league. Uh, they were six and six in a non-conference play. Cal State Fullerton was fourth in their league. They were seven and five in a non-conference. Lipscomb was second in their league. They were ten and five uh, in their non-conference. And Georgia State was nine and four. Um, none of these teams won a Power Six game uh, this season. Uh, there were also three Power Six victories. They all came from fourteen seeds. Um, looking at twenty nineteen. Um, there were actually seven Power Five wins this season. Power Six, I keep saying five. Power Six wins um, through the low seeds in this tournament, and uh, actually two of them came from um, Gardner Webb. They beat North Carolina Central and Wake Forest um, that season, and they finished um, time for second in that conference. And they were ten and five in the non-conference uh, with the two non with the two Power Five wins and the five mid major wins. Um, looking at that. And then just kind of jumping forward, just really quick, their resume is just like Groundlands this season. Groundland was seven and five uh, in the non-conference. Um, they they uh, they they play. Um, they only played a few games less than Gardner Webb. They were seven and five. They were ten and five. Uh, Groundland finished tied for first in the in the SWAC. Uh, they won two Power Five games and they had three mid-major victories. And he played four power five teams overall. So, you know, I mean, that that was a team that did not um, did not make the first four that year. And like I said, you know, just because you make the first four, you don't make the first four, you still a 16. But I think a lot of it comes down to a I think they look at how your conference is overall. Um, obviously, you know, with a two and whatever, 20 and whatever record um, that's going to weigh you down. And the record is like that every year. Um, that's going to weigh you down because a lot of times these teams and these leagues start to get multiple bids um, based on the performance of previous years. Like if you remember a few years ago, the Horizon League was getting like two and three teams in. Uh, the Missouri Valley was getting like two, three, four teams in. Um, they, because those teams, you know, they had started to build up their reputation. And, you know, I don't know if I don't know if any – one bid league is ever going to be a multiple bid league. I don't know. Um, and I don't, I don't, I can't speak, you know, you know, I don't think really hardly any league that's a one bid league would get multiple uh, bids um, unless the team is like undefeated and they lose in the conference championship. Um, but then it's probably going to come down to who they play. Uh, just, you know, like I said, just looking at this still, I'm um, jumping forward to um, 2022. Uh, Texas Southern made the first four. They uh, were two and seven oh, oh, in non-conference. They had one Power Five win, uh, one mid-major win. They played four, four Power Six teams that year. Um, uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi was uh, 11th and 13. They were fourth in their league. Uh, they had seven mid-major wins. They played three Power Six opponents. Wright State played two Power Six opponents. They were eight and seven in the non-conference. Then they finished fourth in their league. They did have a Power Six victory. Uh, and six mid major victories. Bryant was four and seven. They played one power six opponent. Uh, they had three mid major victories. Um, Georgia State was six and five. They um, had no power six wins. They played two power six opponents and won three mid major games. And Norfolk State was nine and four. Uh, they won the MEAC last uh, last season. They had one power five game on their schedule. And um, 
no power six wins. Uh, just looking at this season, because obviously when you look at, you know, the hot topic was Fairleigh Dickinson. Um, they finished second in their league. They would not have made the tournament if Mary Mack was eligible to go. So they did not even win that conference tournament. Um, they got the bid by virtue of the other, by virtue of the other team not being able to go. So by making it and playing in that game, regardless, they were going to the championship and they lost that game. So this team was seven and eight in the non-conference. They did not, you know, they did not slay everybody that they played. Um, they were seven and eight. Um, they did not win the power a power six game. They only had one power six opponent on their schedule. Um, and they won five mid-major games. So I'm going to pull up their schedule uh, just for reference um, because I think a lot of, you know, I think a lot of what people look at um, are those outlying schedules. Um, you do get some people that, that, that play a lot of power, power six games. Um, just looking at, at the swag before I go through Fairleigh Dickinson's schedule, um, I, I listed all the swag uh, non-conference games as far as records and, you know, who they beat and how many Power 16s they played, just like I did with uh, everybody else. So this season, um, Alcorn, obviously they won the SWAC. They were 3-9 and nine, um, in the non-conference. They did not win a Power 6 game. Uh, they had three mid-major victories, and they had pl- they played three Power 5 games. Gremlin played four. Uh, they were 7-5 and five with the two Power 5 victories and three mid-major victories. Jackson State was 1-12. Uh, they had one mid-major victory. Uh, they played six uh, power six teams. Southern was four and nine uh, in the non-conference. They were uh, they had one mid one power five victory, one mid major victory. They played uh, three power six opponents. Um, per, uh, Alabama and them was four and nine as well. They were o, uh, they were over against power six opponents, and they had one mid major victory. They also played three power six opponents. Prairie View, same thing. Uh, they had a power six uh, power six victory. Uh, over Washington State and one mid-major victory. They played three opponents out of the Power Six. Uh, Bethune-Cookman was 4-9. and nine. They had two mid-major victories, no Power Six victories. They played three uh, Power Six opponents. Pine Bluff was 4-9, and nine, and they did not win a game against uh, a D1 opponent. Uh, they had six Power Six opponents. Uh, Alabama State had three. And they were two and eleven. They did have one mid-major victory. Uh, fam, you played the most power six opponents this season with eight. Um, they were two and nine. If they did not beat a D D one opponent, and Valley was one and thirteen in, in non-conference play. And they played four power six opponents, and they did have a mid-major victory. So, if you look at the number of, um, if you just look at the um, at the swag in this instance. Um, most teams played three between three and four uh, power six opponents. There were only uh, there were only three teams that played more than uh, four power six opponents. So that's not the problem, you know. I, I you know I think a lot of people talk like you know the league plays eleven non conference games and they play ten power six opponents and they don't they don't win those games. The problem is not the power six opponents. The problem is the mid major opponents. We need to win more of those games um, to get ourselves in a better position. That's where you, you know, you need to stack up those wins. I mean, if you can, if you can win a couple of non-conference games against power six opponents and then win, you know, win maybe half of your, of, of your, um, when half of your uh, mid-major games, then you find yourself in a better position. Then you look like Gremlin with 24 wins, um, before you know, twenty-four wins and having seven wins before you even get the conference play. Um, you know, regardless of who you play, um, if you don't win those games, you're going into the conference. Conference, you know, zero and thirteen, one and ten, you know, three and nine, and now you have to win. Um, you you really have to win the bulk of your games um, because to me the number. I look at 20 wins as like the line um, for a, a, a mid-major type of team, a one bid type team to be good. Um, 20 wins, you know, you should be straight. So um, if you don't win a lot of non-conference games, then you have to win a lot of conference games. Um, just looking at um, 
what year was that? 2019, I think it was. 2019 Prairie View went 17 and one in the SWAC. Uh, they were 12, they were 2 and 11 in the non conference. So they were 19 and 12 because of their non conference record. That outweighs the SWAC record. You know, when you have a great record in the SWAC, you know, it's weighed down by the conference net rating, it's, it's weighed down by the net ratings of all net rankings of all the teams in the conference. Um, if you have a great non conference record, but you're struggling conference, people are going to look at look at that as well. So it's important for the league. And I know, you know, and I know that everybody can't win, you know, somebody has to lose in a, in a, in a game. I mean, it's two teams. Somebody got to win, somebody got to lose. So bad teams are not going to win a lot of games, regardless of what league they're in. So you're going to be weighed down by your bottom. I think you need to be more top heavy. Um, you know, your top, Six, seven teams need to really be um, as close to 500 in non-conference as they can get. Um, obviously, everybody's situation is different. You know, some teams need to schedule more games to get money. Um, some teams, you know, just, you know, that's just the way the schedule falls some years. Um, just looking at, um, you know, that's just, you know, that's, to me, that's just where the problem comes. Um, the SWAC. As far as net ranking goes this season, we had a we had one team over 200, and that was Grambling at 180. Alcorn was 244, Southern was 276, Purdue was 278, Texas Southern was 294, um, Valley was 358, Texas uh, Family was 359, Palm Love was 332, uh, Bama State was 346, and then was uh, 319, but Cookman 348, Jackson State 305. So. When you look at those rankings, um, that really weighs a, weighs the league down. You know what I mean? A lot of it comes from who you play and how you play. Um, so just just wanted to take a look at at, at Fairly Dickinson's Fairly Dickinson schedule. Um, they lost to Loyola, Loyola Chicago this season. They played Mercy, whoever that is. Um, they played Manhattan, who they beat. That was a mid-major team. They played uh, – um, S-I-U-E, um, they lost that game. Uh, they lost to Longwood. They lost, they beat uh, VMI. They lost to Pitt by twenty by 22 points. Pitt was a super bubble team. Pitt was a first four team. Um, obviously, it's one game, but, you know, that's a power six opponent. So, that just, you know, and it was early in the season. And I, you know, I shoot them some bail. Uh, they had a new system. But, you know, they got blowed out by a power six team. So it's not like they just ran through everybody they played. Uh, they lost to St. Peter's by 14. Uh, they lost to Hartford by 13. Uh, they beat St. Joseph's by 17. Uh, they beat Columbia by three in overtime. Uh, they lost to beat NJIT by two. They lost to Richmond by, by 29. Um, and then they finished out their non-conference schedule losing to Queens. Uh, Queens College, which is in North Carolina, I, um, you know, so it, like I said, when you, it, a lot of things, you know, I think a lot of time people just look at, you know, that one game and you, you automatically assume this team is, is, is everything, you know, but this team lost at home to Queens, North Carolina, whoever that is. Um, you know, SWAC teams lose to non non D one opponents. Man, people have a heart attack. So you know, it, it it's. I'm just saying that it's it happens all over the place. You know that didn't that didn't lessen. Uh, that made that victory over Purdue even more incredible because this team really did not play well early in the season. Um, I think they got hot um, as the season went on, but. Their schedule was not, you know, it was not a, a super hard schedule. It was not super challenging. Uh, to me, that's the kind of schedule that, you know, that SWAC team should have. Um, looking at a lot of these team schedules, they play, um, you know, three or two or three power six opponents. They play five or six mid-major opponents. And a lot of these teams have two or three sub D1 opponents on their schedule. So, it's no different than 
than our schedules. The difference is we don't get home games. To me, that's to me that's the biggest difference in all of this. If we get more home games, we have a better chance to win because most teams in the SWAC are really good at home. Um, I do think that Pac-12 SWAC Legacy Series is a good thing. It gives you an, an opportunity to play a power six opponent at your arena, um, which is rarely is going to happen. But OVC, A Sun, you know, all, all those kind of conferences that's right around you. Um, getting some of those teams to come to your to your arena, um, it, it can go a long way in getting you some victories because you know, playing one or two games at home and they all uh sub D one opponents um does not really help you um pick up those wins that you need. So to me, the main key is to not schedule a gang of power six opponents. Um if you can, and I, like I said, I know everybody, you know, got different situations, but if you can keep it to three, um, maybe four at max, um, as a, on a 13 game non-conference schedule, because I think everybody in SWAC plays 12 or 13 games in a non-conference. Um, I would say three power six opponents, let's say, um, eight, eight, uh, mid-major opponents, Give me uh, three of those at home, five on the road. Maybe maybe it's some of those five in a tournament somewhere. Um, and then maybe two D, two non-D, one opponents, maybe at the beginning of the season to kind of get your foot in, under you um, to open up your home schedule. But, you know, I I think that's the way to go. So do I think the SWAC would be a, 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 a multi-bid league at any point? I don't because I don't think any conference that's a one-bid league is going to be a multi-bid league unless those unless that league elevates um their stature uh to a high degree with consistent um multiple 20 20 win teams um that are very successful out of conference so i just don't really see that happening to anybody um at this point so what you need to do is when you know i, I know a lot of people don't like playing in the first four um it's got a stigma to it but a team won in the first four and went and beat us, uh, beat a number one seed. So, you know, I, if once people look at it like you got two, that's two, two NCAA tournament wins, they both count. So, winning that game gives you a better opportunity. You know, you got a chance to, you know, you play on Wednesday, you play on Tuesday, whatever it is, then turn around and play on Thursday or Friday. You got a game under your belt. You got the nerves out your system. You know, you playing, you know, you got your one tournament game out of the way. You can come in ready to play. Um, and sometimes you can catch that that team because they don't know which one of y'all they got to play. So, you know, they only got a day to prepare for you. Um, if that team, just because they're number one seed, don't mean they don't got flaws. If they got flaws, sometimes those teams can exploit those. Um, so, it, like I said, that part is all about matchups and um, and style of play. So, you know, that, you know, I, I would I would love to see more teams in our league, maybe be more up tempo, um, maybe use some more motion in their offense. Some of us don't have a lot of size, man. Maybe we should start playing that five out um, offense. And I mean, you're already shooting a lot of threes. A lot of these teams are already shooting a lot of threes. So why don't you build your offense around that and maybe play at a higher tempo, maybe use more pressure on defense, you know, whatever it takes, man, to pick up those victories. Um, because Winning winning mid major games is your key to moving up the ladder because a lot of 14, 15, 16 seeds don't beat power six opponents. So winning mid major games and getting mid major games at home is the key to the whole thing. So answer my question earlier, does the SWAC have a basketball problem? No, the SWAC doesn't have a basketball problem. The SWAC has a scheduling problem. One bid leagues all have a scheduling problem. We all have the same problem. So it's the only way you can really, you know, navigate this is to take advantage of the situation and try to, you know, get more home games. You know, I mean, that's where that's where the key comes. Do I think it can be done? Um, it's possible, but I, you know, I don't really see a lot of teams getting that many games at home, so it, you need to try to work at home and homes or whatever with some of these local teams and see what you can do. So that's going to do it for me today, man. Like I said, I just wanted to touch on that. 
Again, I'm going to link the article from hbcusports.com in my description, and I'm going to link the actual audio uh, from the interview with Charles Edmund and Dr. McClellan um, also in my description. So that's going to do it for me, man. I'm about to get on up out of here. Y'all enjoy the rest of y'all day, and we'll catch y'all on the rebound. Peace.